Welcome back, welcome back. This is still one in the morning and we have uh, gotten to the health conversation. Today we want to talk about, we wanted to talk about uh, trauma management, but we're changing that a little bit and talking about recovering from drug addiction. But we'll touch on a bit on trauma management because we had mentioned it to you. Uh, the guest that we have in studio is an expert of both. She is a consulting therapist and coach. She goes by the name Faith Mohonja. Karibu sana, Faith. Thank you so much. Glad to have you with us. I'm happy to be here. All right. So you're a consulting um, uh, therapist. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. What's your experience with um, handling uh, trauma management, uh, you know, trauma um, patients and uh, also people that have had addictions with drugs, not just drugs, but all types of addiction, so recovering from addiction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's been an interesting experience mm -hmm. because I get to interact with so many different people and families. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe as a society, we are becoming more cautious of mental health as a whole. Mm -hmm. And that's an amazing thing as compared to before when it used to be something that was stigmatized. Yeah. Yes. So we are definitely heading to the right direction. Okay. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So we had promised our viewers that we would talk about trauma management, but we have switched things up a bit. Uh, we'll probably talk about it next time when you come. But uh, we want to talk about dry, uh, no um, recovering from addiction. But before we get into that, because we had promised them, tell us a little bit about trauma management. Uh, there's a question that my co-host had asked before he left uh, uh, the set. He asked, does trauma that people experience in childhood affect them later or does wrong parenting cause trauma to children? It does. It does. Uh a lot of people that grow up in dysfunctional families actually end up uh, being affected in their adulthood. Mm -hmm. More so when they undergo negligence, you know, or absent parents, mm -hmm. uh, they end up being affected. And there can also be a sexual assault on children, which will definitely result in trauma in their adulthood and it affects them in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. For example, if you undergo trauma, uh, you are less likely to be able to form healthy relationships in your mm -hmm. adulthood. And even if you do, it will be a struggle to maintain them. So at the end of the day, even when you talk about productivity at work, it becomes a struggle okay. because you have been affected, you have to go back and like uh, fix that so mm -hmm. that you don't become fixated at that point. And okay. that's why it's important to seek professional help mm -hmm. whenever someone has undergone something traumatic in their childhood. Because a lot of how we are in our adulthood is a result of our childhood. Mm -hmm. You know, it's usually say that uh, the child is the parent of the adult, mm -hmm. you know? So okay who you are right now mm -hmm. is a result of your upbringing, your race, you know? So uh, if you are not, if you did not get the affection and the attention you needed while growing up, mm -hmm. uh, there'll definitely be a problem. Okay. Yes. So what kind of trauma do, what causes trauma, or what does trauma look like mm -hmm. for someone who doesn't really, can't really get, um, you know, an understanding of trauma. How does it look like? Uh, trauma is just when an event happens to a person and this person is unable to move past that event. Mm -hmm. That means it could have been tragic or mm -hmm. sudden, something that this person did not expect. And so they end up struggling with coming to terms with whatever happened. Mm -hmm. Yes. For example, uh, a lady who goes through rape should yeah. be traumatized because this is something that has affected mm -hmm. her entirety, you know. Mm -hmm. So she ends up struggling, trusting men, trusting herself. Yeah. Okay. And does trauma have a connection to addiction? What we're talking about next? It's can can yes. it lead to addictions? It can. Uh, mm -hmm. Most people who are traumatized end up trying to self-medicate 
and in the process they end up becoming addicted to mm. these drugs. Okay. For example, uh, a man who was in the military war mm -hmm. and uh, is discharged, becomes a veteran, is most likely to try self-medicating to reduce the flashbacks that come as a result of the trauma. And by doing this, they might actually end up becoming addicted. Right. If it was alcohol or mm -hmm. whatever drug of choice they were using to okay. self-medicate, there's a likelihood they will become hooked to it mm -hmm. because uh, they will want to get that ease, you know, that relief from mm -hmm. the experience that they went through. So mm -hmm. they'll keep on going back to using drugs. Okay. Yes. So now... Um, uh, with addiction, we have said they keep on get going back. Maybe you can lay a clear distinction between being an addict and just, you know, being a user. <laughs> if there's a difference, yes. what, to what extent do you get to be an ad addict? Uh, we usually say they are social users and they are addicts. Mm. When we talk about a social user, this is a person that uh, is a functional user of their drug of choice. That means they use these drugs, but they are still able to function. They are still able to go mm -hmm. to work. They are still able to be there for their families. But when we talk about addiction, one thing that most people don't actually realize is that addiction is a disease. So it's not something that uh, a person can fight against. And it's not something that a person wants for themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, when you talk about addiction, this person cannot do without their drug of choice. Completely. Yes. All right. And is there a, a way that they can get over an addiction by themselves in their own efforts? There are some who do, mm -hmm. but uh, it's not usually easy. And mm -hmm. for most people, they will require more. They'll require more support, they'll require more help, mm -hmm. rehabilitation, because uh, a lot of people who try to get over addiction by themselves, they actually find themselves falling back into using. Okay. And not that, uh, you know, at this point, when a person is an addict, their willpower is not there. They can no longer, like, uh, commit themselves to stop and just stop. Mm -hmm. They will need to go under the therapy sessions, the rehabilitation, yeah, okay. to be able to stop. All right. And we'll get to the, uh, to the rehabilitation process. But let's talk about the different forms of addiction that are there apart from drugs. What other form of addiction does someone get into? Yeah. Uh, there are also behavioral addictions. Mm -hmm. Apart from the drug addiction, there is behavioral addiction. Like? I, like, uh, let's say, sex addiction, okay. gambling. Mm -hmm. Gambling is a form of behavioral addiction. So when we talk about behavioral addiction, the only difference t between it and drug addiction is that when it comes to behavioral addiction, mm -hmm. this person cannot do without that behavior. And they find themselves uh, repeatedly doing that same behavior, even though it produces negative results. Okay. Uh, yes. So they just, you know, it's easy to, to um, associate addiction with drugs and alcohol. But speaking of behavioral addiction, some people, uh, you know, as you said, get into sexual addictions. And some don't know if it's actually a result of maybe a trauma that mm -hmm. they experienced. But you've said it could be a, a result of yes. trauma at the end of the day. And also gambling. They look at it as something... I believe gambling and betting could be in the same bracket. They are. They are in the same bracket, yes. yes. So um, they get into it and uh, they see it as something that they're doing to help themselves, but it's actually an addiction that they have gotten into, which is not beneficial to themselves. Yes. So is there any between, uh, probably not, but let me just ask, is there any that's better than the other or easier to handle than the other? Behavioral versus... Uh, the substance abuse addiction? Mm, I wouldn't say so because mm. when we look at both of them, the consequences of both are really dire, you know, mm -hmm. because when you talk about behavioral addiction, a person can end up spending all they have on these habits mm -hmm. that they are unable to control. Mm -hmm. So uh, they can end up 
using all their finances to sustain that habit, let's say if it's gambling, you know, there are people who give away even their houses, their land, just to satisfy that urge. Mm. And when you come to drug addiction, the same happens. So the consequences of both are really dire and negative. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's one that is better than the other. It is just that people who have um, behavioral addictions most times don't realize as okay. you have said, mm -hmm. that they are actually addicted to something okay. that is not good for them. All right. Mm. So now, um, how do you, what is the process, how do you handle uh, cases where in rehabilitation basically take t taking or working with a patient who has a drug addiction or any form of addiction? How does the process look like? Uh, I, I believe the first step is always to help this client or this person mm -hmm. understand that whatever they are having or whatever they are struggling with mm -hmm. is not their fault, you know, to mm -hmm. help them come out of that denial. Because most of them come into therapy yeah. with a lot of denial. They still don't want to accept that this is where this addiction has brought them actually mm -hmm. and most of them it requires them to hit rock bottom for them to like uh, to agree that things are out of control so the first step is usually to help them overcome the denial so the the need to fast to know that they have the addiction yes okay and is it before you continue is it also paramount for them to know why the reason why they got addicted to it it is it is and mm. that's why during therapy sessions uh it's important for a therapist to find the underlying issue okay. because there is always the underlying issue mm -hmm. i don't believe that someone just wakes up one day and becomes an addict mm -hmm. there must be something that has gotten them to that point Okay, mm. so now, yeah, take, you were taking us through the process, so yes. now, yeah, after that? So after they have actually accepted uh, and moved past the denial, it becomes easier to help them even understand what you are saying, the underlying issue, whatever has brought them to this point. Mm -hmm. And after that, uh, you just work with the client to move past that. Mm -hmm. You psychoeducate them about the addiction because they require knowledge you know when mm -hmm. you have a problem you need to understand mm -hmm. just yeah. like when you go to hospital and you find out you have cancer they will give you psychoeducation on what that is and how to go about it just helping them understand the triggers uh, what they should avoid even after the rehabilitation mm -hmm. how they should manage their lives because we, we always say uh, addiction is not something that can be cured, but it's something that can be managed. Okay, that's a very good point there. I thought it could be cured. Like, I thought somebody can totally, completely get over an addiction, but it can be managed. So you, okay, w expound on that. Yes, so uh, when it comes to addiction, mm -hmm. uh, a person who is addicted, let's say to alcohol, mm -hmm. for the rest of their lives, they've they stand a chance of falling back into using. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, uh, you know, we say that addiction is a chronic disease. All right. Yeah, we say it's a chronic disease. That means it's something that this person will live with for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. They will just learn how to live with it. I, I believe it's just like, uh, let's say, b high blood pressure, mm -hmm. diabetes, you yeah. know, these mm -hmm. chronic diseases, you just learn how to live with it. But when it comes to addiction, it's actually, it's a bit tricky because uh, if it's not well managed, it can end up leading to the person's death. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Okay, very interesting. So now uh, you've taken the person to uh, past uh, the denial stage. They've gotten to understand the triggers and uh, um, what the underlying factors of it. And then now with that, it just uh, the sessions continue. That's just yes. what happens. Yes. The until sessions, they are able to. Mm -hmm. Yes, until they are able to stand uh, on the... by. You know, until they are able to manage this by themselves, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. but we keep on working with them because you have said it's a lifetime disease. So even as counselors, we keep on working with these people even after we complete the sessions. All right. Yes. Okay. And uh, this happening, is it in a rehab center or can for an addict? Mm -hmm. Or can, can you have like a day in, you know, a, I outpatient. don't know. An outpatient, yes. rather. Yeah. Do you have to, to be an inpatient for, you can for this be an, too? I believe it's usually more of what the family feels is mm -hmm. flexible for them or right for them. So there are patients who are, who are inpatients and there are patients who are outpatients. Okay. So it also depends on the severity of the illness. Mm -hmm. So how far has it progressed? Mm -hmm. Because addiction is also progressive. All right. Yeah, it starts from uh, a point where they are able to control it and then it ends up being something they can't control. Okay. So a person who is unable to like totally live their lives normally, we usually recommend inpatient treatments. All right. Mm -hmm. So now, um, there's this thing that people normally say, that you can't really help an addict if they don't want to be helped. Is it, is it true? Do you, is it, does it have to come from within that you w really want uh, to get out of the addiction? Because otherwise you'll sleep back even after you have recovered of yes, some sorts. It does. Actually, uh, for you to be able to help an addict, they have to be willing. As you have said, the force has to come from within. Mm -hmm. uh, no matter how much this person wants to change for someone else, there will always be a likelihood of them falling back. But when they decide that they want to do it for themselves, they are more likely to succeed at it. Mm -hmm. So even if you force uh, an addict to go through treatment and their mind is made up that they will not change, even mm. at the end of the rehabilitation period, they'll still go back to using okay. until they decide that they want to do it for themselves. So what does the family do in such an instance? You know your, your family, remember your brother, your sister is in a bad state mm -hmm. and you need to help them. And that's the f much you can go take them to rehab. So uh, how, how do they handle such situations? Do you help them uh, in such instances? You know, we can always do only as much as we are able to do. Mm -hmm. You can't do past what someone is allowing you to do for them. Mm -hmm. And so by the family just taking that first step and bringing their loved one to the rehab, but their loved one is not willing to still move past that. Mm -hmm. uh, they might complete the period of rehabilitation, but the next day that they are released, mm -hmm. they go back to using. So we usually, you know, we usually say that they are Unfortunate, so no matter what you do, they will always fall back into using. And there's nothing you can do about it. there's nothing can do about it. Uh, have you ever gotten a case where someone was unwilling, but then they get uh, into rehab and through the counseling, maybe they somehow change their mind? Yes, quite a few. Because uh, also exposure to all that psychoeducation, mm -hmm help some people to actually see that there was a problem. Because mm -hmm. uh, what usually limits a lot of people from accepting treatment is the aspect of denial, the aspect of uh, there is no problem with me, you know? My mm -hmm. family is just uh, getting into my business unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. But when you sit down with these clients and through the sessions, you help them see where their life was heading Mm -hmm. There are some who actually have a change of heart mm -hmm. and they end up like they end up sustaining the journey of recovery. Okay. Mm. Amazing. Do you have examples of successful outcomes that you have seen? You know, you know, some amazing, spectacular, different from the others that you've seen uh, in the patients that you've had? Yes, yes, quite a few. And it actually fulfills my heart mm -hmm. when uh, a client goes through my hands and after that I see them, you know, picking up their lives and mm -hmm. moving on to become what they wanted to be. Mm -hmm. I've had quite a few because we usually do follow-ups. 
Okay. Yes, so when they come and we get to talk and you know, whenever they are stuck, they can always call. So mm -hmm. it's like in the long run, we are their support system. Mm -hmm. And it's just amazing when a client becomes sober for a long period of time and they are able to sustain it mm -hmm. because you also get to see the happiness in their families. Mm -hmm. And it's an amazing thing. It's so satisfying. Wow, oh, amazing. Mm -hmm. Clearly, you, and you, you know, you, <laughs> your face <laughs> lights up when you say that. So now, um, many survivors or many people that have been through rehab and have recovered or at least are managing it, as you've said, say that it's usually hard now after rehab, especially those that are inpatient, you've come from this environment where you, have, you believe yourself, you have changed and go, you go back and you face the same conditions. Maybe it was just you taking yourself, mm -hmm. but still the triggers are there. I don't know if these are the triggers. Yes. Maybe it was your family, the ca the chaos that is there, or the people, how they perceive you. This is an alcoholic. Even when you change, you're still an alcoholic. You know, what would you what do you say to uh, that? When the clients are still in sessions, mm -hmm. we usually prepare them psychologically for mm -hmm. what lies on the other side, even mm -hmm. after they complete. Uh, the first thing we usually tell them is that uh, the fact that they are in rehab, mm -hmm. their loved ones are still out there. And, you know, in most cases, uh, addicts cause so much pain and suffering to their family members and as a result even the families become dysfunctional mm -hmm. and sick so the fact that this addict is being treated and the family is still out there there will still be some bit of mistrust even after this person has changed mm -hmm. so it's something that we tell them to expect so that they won't be taken aback and uh, we usually try as much as possible to do as many family therapies. Yeah, I want you to ask yes. about the therapies. Yes. So w when the patient is uh, in rehab, the family is also uh, going through therapy at the same time. Yes, it's important so that even when, even them, they can get to understand mm -hmm. uh, what this addiction is. Because most of the families actually think uh, it's this person not wanting to be serious with life. They want uh, to change. Yes, not wanting to change. Uh, this person just being a spendthrift. Mm. But we help them understand that this is a disease. It's not this person's liking to be the way they are, you know, and just encourage the family to offer this person support, mm -hmm. even as uh, they undergo the treatments. Okay, mm. amazing. So now, uh, the triggers, let's talk a little bit about the triggers. When the person is out for a year with a different addiction, what are the triggers that are usually there? Yes, uh, so when we come to triggers, we usually say they are three. Mm -hmm. It might be people, the people they used to associate with, mm -hmm. maybe the friends they used to use with, uh, maybe the family, as you have said, there are family members who can be triggers. Uh, we talk about places, mm -hmm. the places they used to go to use, mm -hmm. and the places that uh, maybe if the home environment is not really conducive for them, that can be a trigger. Mm -hmm. And the third thing is usually things. When we talk about things, mm -hmm. uh, we refer to, you know, let's say uh, bottles of alcohol okay yes uh let's say for smokers uh, they usually have i think ashtrays mm -hmm. yes so such things can be triggers okay. so they have to do away with this if it's about <coughs> changing environments for a while until they stabilize after the rehabilitation if it's about friends just avoiding the negative people even if it's family members, mm -hmm. you know, because you are able, you are able to walk away from people who are not good for you. Mm -hmm. So we encourage that putting away things that can remind them about using and trigger them into wanting to use. Okay. Yes. So completely disassociating with things that will yes. get them back to what they're actually trying to run away from yes. or recover from. Exactly. Okay. Amazing. Now, before we close this, we've really talked about, you know, uh, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, the things that can be seen, you know, because when you're 
they're addicted to alcohol, you probably see you on the streets, so mm. you know, we'll probably see you reacting. But there are these hidden uh, addictions that we have not talked much about, uh, and these are the behavioral addictions. I don't know if gambling can be seen. I think maybe it depends with if you expose it, choose mm. to expose it, because you can just be betting, chiniamaji, and you're just losing mm. uh, on this end or winning, but still you're addicted to it. And we also have sexual addiction, which is very... Uh, personal it can be very personal only the people that you associate with know but your family might not know about it mm -hmm. and it's actually eating you up so how do you advise them or how do you advise the family are there things to that point out that this person has an addiction for someone to see so that they actually point them out and help them with rehabilitation yes yes there are things that can actually point out that this person needs help mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one of them is when this person starts uh, separating themselves or isolating themselves from their loved ones when they start using all their finances to finance whatever their addiction is and uh, for some people they even end up starting to steal from their loved ones or their friends in order to just have the money to finance their habits mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when there is a uh, some become really irritable whenever you bring that up, you know. If I'm drinking excessively and every time my family wants to bring it up, I get really defensive and angry and irritable. It shows there's a problem mm -hmm. because I already know there's a problem. So I'm just being defensive to like okay. block them from bringing it up again. Mm -hmm. So such things are actually a sign that this person needs help. All right. Yeah. Amazing. What do you what do you say to to those that are going through an addiction and uh, they know it? Maybe they are afraid of coming out and saying that I have a problem and I need help. Uh, yeah. What what do you say to them? And this is your camera. You can speak directly. Yes. Uh, for anyone who is going through an addiction of any kind, there is always help out there. You don't have to walk the journey alone. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage us, even as a society, to embrace these people and just show them more grace, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, if we keep on condemning them, we are not helping them. Even as a family, if you gang up against this person and you keep on uh, trying to guilt trip them, it is likely that it won't work. It will just make mm -hmm. the situation worse. Mm -hmm. So it's for us to become more embracing, mm -hmm. even with their weaknesses, and just more supportive, so that they can feel, uh, they can feel like they can or they are able to seek help. Okay. Because support system is very important. Mm. There are things that we can't walk alone. There are journeys which we can't walk alone. Yeah. Yes. And what about the, I'm still on the behavioral addictions mm. because they're not really much talked about. Mm, How do you come out? Because, you know, it's, it's a bit, sh you know, it's almost normal to say I have a drug addiction and I'm addicted to alcohol, but it's almost shameful to say I have a sexual addiction. Mm. Who do you approach? How do you go about it? Is it the same rehab that, that they go to with those that are addicted to drugs and uh, substance? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. it's the same because for both uh, the aspects of uh, compulsive using or compulsive engaging in the habits mm -hmm. and you know the lack of control mm -hmm. uh, the urges the uncontrollable urges these aspects are the same for both mm -hmm. behavioral and drug addiction so we treat them both in rehabilitation centers there are mm -hmm. no like special rehabs for behavioral and drug addiction okay yes and are there uh, prescribed medication or is it just uh, psychosocial uh, therapy? There are also uh, medication for mm -hmm. both. Okay. Yes, uh, we call it uh, pharma pharmatherapy, pharmacotherapy. Mm -hmm. Yes, so they are usually prescribed by psychiatrists. All right. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for the wonderful insights that you've shared with us, Faith. I don't know if you have any final word that you want to say as you share with us your social media handles. Again, that's your color. Yes. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, I believe we can do more. We can do more. As you have said, there is so much stigma when it comes to some of these issues. Mm -hmm. As a society, we can, we can become more 
more embracing as I've said, because uh, these people, they go through a lot. Yeah. And their families go through a lot. And in the case that a person is an addict, mostly, even the family becomes stigmatized or shamed by mm. the society, which is not really a good thing. So mm. we can move past that as a society and grow into awareness of these issues because they happen. It's not something we can close our mm. eyes to. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, what are your social handles? Uh, in Instagram, mm -hmm. therapist Faith Mohonja. Facebook, Faith Mohonja. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Faith. Asante. Uh, that has been uh, Faith Mohonja, who's a consulting therapist and coach, talking to us about recovering from addiction. I hope you have taken something from it. If you're an addict, there is hope for you. Or if you know someone who's an addict, we need to show more grace to them and to their families because it's a condition like any other. Thank you for staying with us through this conversation. There's still more coming your way. Brand Sakwa will be coming on next with a very, very interesting conversation that you want to be a part of. The hashtag is one the morning at 2254 channel. See you on the other side.